Hello, Iron 5 students. How are you doing today? Coming to you from the big chair in the classroom. Miss all of you. Wish I could be there in person to hang out with you, but that's okay. This way will work. So today we're going to start a new unit in Journeys. Okay. Uh, this new unit in Journeys goes with the story Quest for the Tree Kangaroo. We're going to be reading the story, uh, working on comprehension questions, doing the spelling words, the vocabulary, the grammar, everything that we've traditionally done in the class, it should all be familiar to you. The only thing is the setting is different, right? Um, other than that, we're gonna follow the same routine that we normally would do in class. Uh, so today I'm gonna start off by reading the story, Quest for the Tree Kangaroo. I do highly encourage you to read this on your own as well. It's good to get practice, whether reading out loud or to yourself or both. Um, you could read with a partner at home as well. Um, and then there are some comprehension questions on Google Classroom as well as a cart, hard copy has been sent home uh, that you can use to answer the questions on um, for the story of Quest for the Tree Kangaroo. So uh, if you want to, you can get your book and you can follow along. Uh, we are on pages 174 and 175 to start Quest for the Tree Kangaroo. The story is by Cy Montgomery. And the photographs are by Nick Bishop. Uh, the genre is informational text, uh, which gives us facts and examples about a topic. Uh, we're gonna look for text structure, the way ideas and information are organized. And we're also gonna focus on facts and details about this specific topic. So the essential question that I want you to think about during the story and to reflect upon throughout the unit is why is it important to research and protect endangered animals? I'm certain most, if not all of you, have ideas and thoughts about that question already, but perhaps as we go through this unit, read the story, go over other questions, um, you'll have more insight into that question. So again, I'll just read that question one more time. Um, why is it important to research and protect endangered animals? Okay, so we're going to begin the story. Uh, there's at least one word in here that I have a very hard time pronouncing, so we're just going to have fun with it. Um, it's page 176 that we're going to start at. Okay, top of page 176. Here we go. In lush and colorful Papua New Guinea, there lives an elusive animal called the Matchis tree kangaroo. Biologist Lisa Daybeck has been fascinated by the tree roo since seeing her first one in a Seattle zoo more than 20 years ago. Now she leads a research expedition to Papua New Guinea accompanied by a team of scientists and local guides with the goal of locating Machis tree kangaroos in the wild and fitting them with radio collars so they can be tracked and studied. Lisa and the others hope their studies will help them better understand and protect these special creatures. The team is joined by author Simon Montgomery and photographer Nick Bishop, who are documenting the journey. The group has arrived at their destination and set up camp. They have seen signs that some tree kangaroos are nearby in the forest and are hoping to meet one soon. So top of page 177. We have a couple captions, one for the first page. Um, cool winds have dwarfed some parts of the forest so it's only about 20 feet high. Uh, you see how dwarfed is highlighted there. That's one of our vocabulary words. We'll be reviewing vocabulary words in another session, but still pay close attention to these highlighted words and think about the context of the sentence that they're in. Uh, the other picture here that we have on page 177 is the Machis tree kangaroo. Lisa is washing her clothes in the river when we get the news. Tree roos, calls Holly, two of them. One of the trackers has run back to camp to tell us the two tree kangaroos are klotsu us and still up a tree. While Holly and Christine ready the medical equipment, the rest of us race after the tracker to see. We run past the tree kangaroo house, past the kunai, down a trail, and then into the trackless bush. Will the tree kangaroos still be there when we get there? It takes us nearly an hour to reach the site. We see the long golden tail hanging down from the branches of a sararwu or something. That's the word that I have trouble saying, so we'll do what we can do. And then the animal to whom it belongs, a gorgeous red and gold tree kangaroo sitting 80 feet above us, looking down with ears pricked forward. I can't believe it, Lisa says. 
And then, in the tree right next to this tree kangaroo, we see another tail, leading to another tree kangaroo. Big Pella Picanini! One of the trackers exclaims. Picanini is talk pisan for child or baby. And Big Pella? You guessed it. If this is her baby, it's a big one. So, as you can see, we have some words that we don't normally read or recognize. Um, at the bottom of the page, there are definitions for these words. We have close to, uh, which means close to, and talk pisan. And talk pisan is a popular language spoken in Papua New Guinea. Then we have kunai, which means the area where Lisa and her team have set up camp, named for the kind of grass it has. And then we have that word that I have a difficult time saying, soreyu, something like that. Um, it's the tree that kangaroos love to eat the shoots of um, its flowers, this flowering tree. All right, top of page 178. Well, it's just a photo, so we'll read the caption instead. Um, Machi's tree kangaroo is one of the world's rarest and most elusive mammals. Um, and elusive, by the way, is hard to find. Okay. Um, we'll do the analyze the text questions in another class session. Top of page 179. This is the miracle of doing work here, Lisa says. They are so elusive, and then you finally find them. The whole field season is riding on these moments. The men had left camp that morning feeling lucky. It was a sunny, warm, sunny and warm, Gabriel recalled. A good day for the tree roos to come out and warm themselves. They changed their strategy. For the first three days, we were traveling more than one kilometer each day to find tree roos. I had wanted our presence to drive them closer to camp, so we decided today to try it closer, and it worked. The men spread out. One tracker decided he would look for a plant that the tree kangaroos love to eat. It grows high on tree branches and is easy to spot. The underside is brown and the top green. He found one in a tree, but no tree kangaroo. He scanned the next tree over, the soruiwiwu, and there was the tail. Immediately, the tracker explained through Gabriel. I barked like a dog because that would keep her up in the tree. Everyone else heard the barking and knew what had happened. Everyone ran and admired the roo. We all stood looking for about two minutes, and then someone noticed there was another tail. We photograph and videotape and watch the two tree kangaroos for ten minutes. Now, to get the animals down. The trackers have been thinking about this puzzle. Shortly after they spotted the animals, they began to cut sticks and brush to build a low fence they called an M around the tree. If the tree kangaroo leaps down and starts to hop away, the M will slow him down. One of the trackers takes off his tall rubber boots. Barefoot, he begins to climb a smaller tree next to the sorry -ri. Within two minutes, he's as high as the tree kangaroo. Joel, do you see where she is? Asks Lisa. Joel has the rue in his binoculars. She's still there, he assures. But the tree kangaroo isn't happy to see a human approaching. She climbs another 30 feet up to get away. If she jumps, it's a 110-foot drop. Top of page 180. Suddenly, she leaps, her forearms outstretched. She drops 30 feet. She grabs a smaller tree on the way down, and now she begins to back down the tree. She's almost to the ground when one of the trackers grabs her by the tail and puts her in the burlap bag. Picanini! Picanini! The men call. The other tree kangaroo is 65 feet up in a decaspermum tree, and they don't want him to get away. The tree kangaroo lets go of the branch. Like an acrobat, he catches a vine with his front paws turns himself around and lands on the ground on his feet. One tracker holds the chest, another holds the back legs, and another man holds the front. It's only now that we realize that the baby is a fully grown adult male. Mana Miri, the trackers say. This pair is no mother and baby, but a grown-up male and female on a tree kangaroo date. By 10.10 10 a.m., both tree kangaroos are in burlap bags heading back. 25 minutes later, we're all back in camp, where Holly and Christine have set up the exam table, a picnic table built from saplings lashed with vines. They've laid out medical supplies and sample vials, measuring tools and data sheets. Each tree kangaroo will be given medicine to make it sleep, 
while the team puts on the radio collar and conducts a health exam. We want to find out as much as we can, because so little is known about tree kangaroos, every deal, detail is very important. First, while the animals are in their burlap bags, they are weighed. The female weighs 6.4 kilograms, about 24 pounds, with the bag. The scientists will make sure to subtract the weight of the bag alone later. The male, with bag, weighs 8 kilograms. And here we have a caption for the photograph on the next page. It says, Gabriel spots a tree kangaroo. And then page 82 is another photograph, and the caption for that one is, Once an animal has been seen, a tracker climbs a nearby tree to scare it into coming down. Then we have another photograph on page 183 of a matchy tree kangaroo. It says, A matchy looks down from 80 feet in the canopy. So top of page 183. Joel notes the temperature and humidity too. It's 56.2 degrees Fahrenheit, 81% humidity. Let's measure the male's neck to make sure the radio collar will fit on him, says Lisa. But let's do the female first. With the female, we'll have the same priorities, Holly tells the group. We'll measure the neck, put on the radio collar, insert the ID chip, pluck fur for more testing, check the pouch, see if she has a baby. We hope to find out as much as we can while the animal is asleep, but anesthesia can be dangerous. That's why we'll be careful watching how often she breathes in and out and how fast her heart is beating during the procedure. We'll have to work fast. Everyone will help. Christine will call out pulse and respiration every five minutes, says Holly. Is everybody ready? Do you have the radio collar? Lisa asks Gabriel. Gabriel is holding a leather collar, much like one a dog might wear. Instead of metal tags, though, it has a little box of waterproof plastic. This contains a transmitter powered by a square battery and outfitted with an internal antenna. Each radio collar also has a computer chip. Without knowing it, the tree kangaroos will be sending their position not only to the scientists tracking them on the ground, but also to satellites circling thousands of miles above the Earth. At 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., times the roos are likely to be in the trees and the weather is likely to be less cloudy. The satellites read the animal's exact position on the Earth's surface. They download this information to the chips in the collars, and this data can be transferred to a computer when the collar automatically falls off after five months. The whole thing weighs less than half a pound. All right, we have a photograph on page 184. The caption for that is, Christine and Holly get to work. So top of page 185. Do you have the screwdriver to put the collar on? Asks Lisa. Yes, yes, says Gabriel, holding the squirming bag in his lap. We're ready. But the tree kangaroo isn't. Gabriel talks to the animal in the bag. Wait, wait, come here, he says gently. And then to two trackers. Hold him. Soon a pink nose pokes out through a hole in the bag. It's 10.55 a.m., and Holly places the mask on the nose. A paw comes out through the hole. But within 45 seconds, the tree kangaroo relaxes. The anesthesia is working. She's asleep. Out comes the kangaroo. Thermometer? Holly requests. The kangaroo's body temperature is similar to a person's, 97.1 degrees. Respiration is 32 says Christine. That means she's breathing 32 times a minute. That's healthy. Holly leans forward to listen to the heart through her stethoscope. For five seconds, she counts the beats. She wants to calculate the beats per minute. Heart rate is 16 times 12. You do the math, she tells Joel, who is recording everything on a data sheet. Meanwhile, Gabriel is putting on the collar. Make sure the collar is comfortable but snug, says Lisa. Yesterday, Christine discovered that Ombum had taken his off and left it on the floor of his cage. So, here we have a new character introduced. At the bottom here, we have um, Ombum as a tree kangaroo that was examined earlier and is being treated for an injured leg. So, on to page 186. <coughs> Sorry about that. Holly puts in the microchip, and Joel records its number, 029-274-864. I'm going to do a pouch check, says Holly. 
Meanwhile, the other scientists measure everything they can as fast as they can. Pouch is empty, says Holly. Now for the vitamin mineral shot. This is it, says Lisa. She calls an end to the exam. Because he was injured, Umbum's exam took much longer. But we don't want to subject this tree kangaroo to the anesthesia any longer than necessary, for safety's sake. Holly removes the face mask and quickly checks the teeth. She's coming too. It's 11.06 a.m. Put her in the bag, says Lisa. Tail first so she can sit. They name her Tess in honor of my dog, a border collie who died last year at age 16. The new Tess rests in her bag on a tracker's lap while we prepare for the mail. Now you might notice there are leaves, like little tiny pictures of leaves in different parts of the book here. It's, as you can see, it's um, a, a transition in the story where it's changing either um, location or um, setting. Uh, so once in a while we have these leaves, uh, little visual markers inside the book that are kind of separating um, the book into different sections, the story into different sections. So okay, near the bottom of page 186, 11.20 a.m. Anesthetic machine? Gas ready? Radio collar? Holly asks. And is the other Rue okay? Okay, answers the team. We're ready. Here we have a photo at the bottom of one page 186. Uh, the caption is, the team works fast while the tree kangaroo is anesthetized. Anesthetized. There we go. It's always good to try to pronounce your words that you're having difficulty with, like me right there. Top of page 187, we have another photograph. The uh, caption is, each color allows scientists to track a tree kangaroo for several months. 187. Gabriel unties the top of the male's bag, and immediately the burlap boils with movement. He's doing somersaults in the bag, Gabriel reports. It's all he and Joshua can do to hold the room. Through the bag, the male grabs one man's glove and pulls it off. He bites another tracker on the finger. Now four men are struggling. I've got his head here, says Gabriel, but I can't get it out. But the nose is right here. Through the burlap, Holly delivers the anesthetic. Ah, oh, but he's tough, says Gabriel. Finally, the bag stops wiggling. At 11.30 a.m., the male is lifted out of the bag and laid out on the table. The team goes to work. 17 times 12 is the heart rate, Holly tells Joel. 22.7, circumference of neck, says Toby. Here's the collar. Let's put it on. Respiration is 20, says Holly. Now we'll take his temperature. Next, the chip. And after that, we'll go for the hair. So page 188 is a photograph. The caption is, Holly takes a hair sample for DNA analysis. Top of page 189. Everything is going like clockwork. Then Christine warns, respiration slowing. That's it. Let's pull the mask off, says Lisa. It's 11.37 a.m. His ears are twitching. Let's get him back in the bag, says Holly. It's all over in just 10 minutes. Whew, great work, says Lisa. Noon. We're at the tree kangaroo house. The men have cut fern fronds and lined the two apartments inside with this soft, moist carpet. They've used ferns to screen the wall between the new pair and Umbum, so the animals won't upset each other. Umbum looks calm. Though his leg is no better, he is now taking banana leaves from Christine's hands. We all sit quietly while one of the trackers opens the cage door. Tess climbs out of the bag and scurries up a perch. She regards us with interest, but no fear. Lisa has named the male Christopher, in honor of my pig, who grew to 750 pounds and lived to age 14. The kangaroo Christopher rushes out of his bag and climbs to the highest perch. Joel and Gabriel want to make sure the collars are working, so they have brought their radio receivers along to check. <coughs> Excuse me. Each animal has its own frequency, almost like a phone number. If Joel wants to tune it in to Tessa, to Tess, he dials up channel 151.080. Christopher's channel is 150.050. Both collars work fine. We're all delighted. One tracker is so enthusiastic, he wants to go out and hunt for more tree kangaroos this very afternoon. But the hotel is full, says Lisa. Since Christopher and Tess are healthy enough to return to the wild, they will be released tomorrow. For now, though, the cage has all the tree kangaroos it can hold. We all shake hands, hug, and smile. 
Everyone is beaming with a mixture of excitement, exhaustion, and relief. The first collared male matches tree kangaroo, says Gabriel. History. And there you go. So that was Quest for the Tree Kangaroo. Uh, we're going to be working a lot more on this story, as well as, uh, like I said before, vocabulary words, spelling words, grammar, as the unit progresses. Uh, please remember that there are a few questions that I want you to answer in Google Classroom or the hard copy that you have. Um, if you have any questions, again, remember, you can always email me, or there are perhaps other ways at some point that we can also communicate. So hope you enjoyed the story, and uh, I hope you enjoy this remote learning experience. I know part of it's a bummer, um, but we're going to make the best of it. So all right, students, take care, and we will see you later.